Okay, so now we're going to do one that has a square root. Now before we do anything with this problem, I know we've got to find increase and decreasing local min and local max. Let's first talk about the domain on this one, okay? Because the domain is asking us to find absolute extrema, so I'm probably going to have to make sure I, I check uh, some endpoints here. This one actually is not going to have negative infinity to positive infinity as domain. So let's do the first thing, let's check our domain because that's going to be really important later on in this problem. When I find my answers for critical numbers, they have to actually fit the domain of the problem itself, otherwise they're not going to be considered critical numbers at all. First, I know that x cannot equal zero. Okay, We know that because we can't divide by zero. Second, let's look at this. Square root has to be positive in the inside. So I know that if I put a three in there, I'll get a zero. But if I put anything more than a three, like a four, I'm going to get square root of negative number. So this problem also, I can't use any numbers that are outside negative 3 to 3. So here is my domain. I'm going to write an interval notation. Negative 3 to 0, and then from 0 to 3. That's it. These are the only numbers you're allowed to put inside here. So I want to, I want to watch out for this as I'm going through. If I get a critical number of 0, first of all, I know it can't be a critical number because 0 is not included in my domain. Or if I get anything outside of that, then I know that it can't be a critical number either. So it's always good for problems with square roots to do the domain first. That way when we, we can look back at it later. All right, let's try and attempt to find if there are any critical numbers here. Let's see if they fall in this uh, interval or not. This kind of problem, because we have a division happening, we need to do this by the quotient rule. Okay, so I'm going to do quotient rule for this. The quotient rule says that we take the bottom thing and then times the derivative of the top. This top part here, I can do 9 minus x squared to the 1 half power. So when I do the derivative of this, I got to do chain rule. So 1 half comes down. 9 minus x squared, subtract 1 from the exponent, I'll get negative 1 half. And then, don't forget to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So, this is our function, this is the, the top piece. The, the whole derivative of this is this whole thing here, 1 half times this, and then times negative 2x. Okay, then we got the rest of the quotient rule, minus the top thing. So the top thing, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it in the square root form. Times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of 2x of x squared is 2x. It's over the bottom squared. So I have x squared squared. Now I have to clean this up. Okay, so f prime of x, I get, okay, the 2's are going to cancel here. I get x times x squared. I get negative x cubed on the bottom. Square root of 9 minus x squared. And that's the, and there's a 2 out. Uh, so 2 is gone. So this and this cancel, and then if I clean it up, this is what I have left over. I get this part here. Then I have a minus 2x square root of 9 minus x squared, and that's going to be over 1. And of course, all this again is going to be over x to the fourth. Now what you want to do is you want to clear up these complex fractions here. So I need to find a common denominator. I want to get the common denominator of square root of 9 minus x squared. So this one, I'm going to multiply by nine minus, square root of 9 minus x squared, top and bottom. Okay. And then that will allow me to get common denominator here. Then I can flip over the fraction on the bottom and I can get one single fraction. You want to get that before you start setting things equal to zero. You want to make sure that you have uh, just one fraction for it. Okay, I'm going to get negative x cubed. And then when I multiply this, I get negative 2x, and then this will just be 9 minus x squared because I'm multiplying the two radicals together. And on the bottom, I have the square root of 9 minus x squared. And then this right here, that's the same thing as 1 over x to the fourth. So I'm multiplying by the reciprocal, and that way at least I can get a single fraction out of it. We're not done yet. We need to do a little bit more simplifying on top. Okay, so. When you do that part, negative x cubed, and then you have minus 18x plus 2x cubed. And distribute that through. On the bottom, I have x to the fourth and then square root of 9 minus x squared. 
This part here, we're going to uh, continue. We're going to do 2x cubed minus x cubed. That's positive x cubed minus 18x over x to the fourth square root 9 minus x squared. Now, because I have a common factor of x here, I can divide out an x on top with one of them from the bottom. So when I do that, I can get the final reduced answer. I'm going to get x squared minus 18. And then I'll get rid of one of the x's on the bottom, x cubed. And then square root of 9 minus x squared I have on the bottom. So this now is going to be my first derivative. We look at which things here will make the derivative undefined. That's going to be 0 and also any numbers outside of that. But that just goes back to the same domain that we had before. So if it's not defined on the original one, that means if it's not defined on the derivative either, that means it's not going to be a critical number. A critical number has to be defined on the original one. We just end up with the same result that we had for the first one. We get that. So we're not going to find any critical numbers that way, but the other way to find a critical number is to set the derivative equal to zero. Okay, so, so in this case, because I have a fraction, whenever you have a fraction, all you're really concerned about is setting the top part equal to zero. Because if I set it equal to zero and cross multiply, I'll just end up getting the top equal to zero anyway. So I have x squared minus 18 is going to be set equal to zero. We're going to solve for that. I get x is equal to the square root of 18, which I, I can make that plus or minus 3 square root of 2. Don't forget again, when you take the square root, you do get two answers here. Plus or minus 3 square root of 2. Now, we already said earlier that you're not able to put any numbers that are outside of that domain. So therefore, even though we solved and we got that as answers, these are not going to be critical numbers either because... 3 times square root of 2 is definitely bigger than 3 and it's smaller than negative 3. So therefore, we don't have any critical numbers on this problem. So the question is, well, how do we set up our table? What, what numbers do we know how to put on there? They're going to come directly from this right here, directly from your domain. We have a negative 3, we have a 0, and we have 3. We're not allowed to test any numbers outside of this domain, so we have to stick to just these two inside here. So the only test numbers I'm going to do will be 1 and negative 1. I want to put these into the derivative function. Okay, so I have a 1 on top. Negative I get on the top. On the bottom, I get a positive, which means that I get a negative for the first piece. Then I'm going to put a negative 1. Negative 1 squared minus 18 is negative. Negative 1 cubed is also negative. This is positive. So I get negative over negative. I get a positive there for this problem. So I get a plus for this region. So now I'm, re I'm ready to write the increasing and decreasing. So increasing is where I have a plus. So increasing, I'm going to write 0 to 3, and 3 I'm actually going to include the 3 in the end. 3 can be included here in this case. That's the end point. It's not going to be to infinity because remember the domain only goes up to 3. Decreasing, okay, so decreasing is going to be from negative 3, that's going to have a bracket on that end, negative 3 to 0. So that's our increasing and decreasing intervals. Now, once we have this, we have to look for the local max and local min. We're going to go down, we're going to go up. First derivative test says that we have a minus and a plus. Zero is going to be a relative min. So I have a local min at, okay, zero is the x value. This goes back into the original one. Now, what happens here? It's not defined on the original one. I'm dividing by zero. We already mentioned that zero is not going to be in your domain. So because of that, we can say that there's no local max or min. For the absolute min and max, we're going to look at these endpoints. Now the graph itself, if you were to graph it, it's closed here and we have this vertical asymptote at zero. So basically I have negative three and three here. That's what the graph looks like. So because of that, I actually have a lowest point here I have on the endpoints. So, what you have here is absolute 
the min is going to occur at these endpoints. Negative 3 comma 0 and 3 comma 0. If you put 3 here in the top, you get 0. 0 or anything is 0. So therefore, your absolute min is going to be occurring here uh, at the endpoints. Okay, so that's the only thing we're going to have. Because this goes up forever towards infinity, that means there will be no absolute max.